you can't do chemistry without reagents, so that is where we will start our tour. In front, you see where I keep my most commonly used reagents. We will start off with a general overview, and then I will go into more specifics of what is contained on each shelf. Down here on the bottom left, we have my acid storage. There are two bins. The bottom one contains reagent-grade concentrated acid, while this top bin contains diluted stock solutions as well as hardware store-grade acid. Then on top of that, we have four amber glass containers, only one of which is full. Uh, this one contains my stock of 30% hydrogen peroxide. Between the acid storage and the main shelf of chemicals, we have a few jerry cans as well as a safety can that contains gasoline. I will explain later why gasoline is so useful to the amateur chemist. Then on top of this shelf here, we have my element storage as well as metal storage two shelves of solid reagents, and then two shelves of liquid reagents. Down here in this drawer on the bottom, we have excess reagents that I couldn't fit uh, on the top shelves. My solid reagents are split on two shelves. The top one contains the less reactive ones, and the bottom shelf contains the more reactive ones. I know that's not the best way to segregate chemicals, and they should be split based on hazard class. However, due to space limitations, this has to do. And so far, nothing's blown up, so that's a good sign. Moving from the left on the top shelf, we have the carbonates, the acetates. In the middle, we have the chlorides, bromides, and aldides. And on the far side, we have the sulfates, the phosphates, and some miscellaneous organics, such as glucose and gelatin. Moving on to the bottom shelf, on the left, we have the oxidizing agents, such as potassium chlorate, potassium nitrate, potassium dichromate. Towards the middle, we have the more toxic reagents, such as barium chloride, uh, cobalt, nitrate, etc. And on the right side, we have the more reactive chemicals such as calcium carbide, uh, calcium hypochlorite, as well as phosphorus pentoxide. And on the very far right, we have the hydroxides, including sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. I store my liquid reagents on the bottom two shelves as well as in the drawer. The left side of the third shelf consists of hydrocarbons such as xylene, hexanes, petroleum ether, limonene, jet fuel, and kerosene. The middle is where I keep my glycols such as ethylene glycol and polyethylene glycol as well as glycerol. To the right of that, I have the uh, esters such as ethyl acetate, ethyl benzenoate, and methyl salicylate. Then to the right of that, are the oxygenated organic solvents such as dimethoxymethane as well as acetone. And then on the far right is where I keep my chlorinated solvents. Right now I only have dichloromethane. Moving on to the bottom shelf, it is all alcohols. Moving from the left, we have the methanol, the ethanol, uh, some more methanol, isopropanol, and on the right is where I keep the bulk of my ethanol. Finally, in the bottom drawer, we have lots more bottles of ethanol since that's the most readily available organic solvent here. Then two bottles of 1-hexene, which I use for my extended essay for the IB program. Then two bottles of 25% ammonia solution. And finally, four bottles of in-hexane, which I use for extractions. Speaking of extraction solvents, one of the cheapest and most easily available to the amateur chemist is gasoline. Now, gasoline cannot be used directly from the pump since it contains many additives as well as higher boiling hydrocarbons that are difficult to remove from the extraction mixture. Therefore, it needs to be distilled into something called white gas. Unlike what you may have been taught in school, gasoline does not consist mainly of octane. Instead, it contains mostly a range of hydrocarbons between pentane and heptane. These all have a boiling point below 80 degrees and so, by collecting the fraction that boils under this temperature, a usable organic extraction solvent can be obtained. In my case, I use a modified pressure cooker alongside a homemade copper pipe Liebe condenser to process large amounts of gasoline. In this way, I can get to around a gallon in an hour. So, what acids do you need as a beginner amateur chemist? The first is sulfuric acid. Here on the left, you can see a sample of 98% concentrated sulfuric acid, which I distilled myself. However, acid of this concentration and purity is usually not available in most countries. Therefore, your next best bet for finding concentrated sulfuric acid will be through a drain cleaner. 
Now, the only two brands I'm aware of in my country which contain the acid is this one called Hot Power by Comstar and this one called Eliminate Drain Pipe Opener. Now, both of these contain a relatively high concentration of the acid, but I prefer the Hot Power because it comes crystal clear right out of the bottle and is 93%, whereas Eliminate is reddish brown and is only 88%. Failing to find drain cleaner, Another option that is available in virtually any country is battery acid. Battery acid is typically more pure than drain cleaner since dirty acid can easily poison a lead acid battery. However, it is of a lower concentration, usually at only 37%. This may be further concentrated by boiling it down where you can reach concentrations of about 85%. To reach truly azeotropic acid, a distillation is needed. However, this is rather dangerous and not a procedure I recommend for beginners. A lesson I learned the hard way when working with sulfuric acid is the importance of wearing clothes you don't mind getting damaged or better yet, a lab apron. This is because sulfuric acid is non-volatile and so the small microscopic droplets that splash onto your clothes will become more and more concentrated as the water evaporates. Eventually, they will start attacking the clothes fibers and the next time you wash your clothes, you will be greeted by lots of tiny holes and you will wonder how they got there. Don't make the same mistake I did. The next acid you need as an amateur chemist is hydrochloric acid or aqueous HCl. What I'm holding now is the reagent grade concentrated 37% kind. However, much more readily available is muriatic acid from most hardware stores. This kind of acid usually has a yellowish discoloration due to iron contamination. Now the thing with purifying hydrochloric acid is to keep in mind the critical concentration of 20%. At acid concentrations above 20%, which is the azeotrope, heating the acid will result in the off-gassing of hydrogen chloride vapors. This may be a good thing if you're trying to concentrate more dilute but pure acid or be a bad thing if you're trying to avoid releasing a cloud of highly toxic and corrosive gas. On the other hand, acid below the 20% concentration can be safely uh, distilled and will yield acid of the 20% azeotrope. The final crucial acid for the amateur chemist is nitric acid. On the left is a bottle of 67% concentrated nitric acid. However, when first starting out, this acid is less important than the other two, since it can be easily made by the reaction of sulfuric acid with a nitrate salt, such as potassium nitrate or ammonium nitrate. Potassium nitrate can be obtained as a stump remover or fertilizer, and ammonium nitrate can be found in instant ice packs. Double check to make sure your ice pack contains ammonium nitrate since modern manufacturers often substitute it with ammonium chloride or urea. The three acids I just talked about are the most important ones for the beginner amateur chemist. Other acids can usually be made by the reaction of sulfuric acid with the corresponding salt. For instance, this hydrobromic acid was made by the reaction of sulfuric acid with sodium bromide. Eventually, you will find the need for other types of acids, such as glacial acetic acid or phosphoric acid. However, these are not essential for the beginner and should be purchased as needed. The cabinet to the left of the chemical storage area is where I keep my organic reaction glassware. When starting out, at a minimum, you should aim to get a 3-necked 500ml round-bottom flask, a still head, a Liebig 300ml condenser, a vacuum takeoff adapter, a receiving flask, as well as a thermometer adapter for monitoring the distillation temperature. Kits like these can be found on eBay alongside tubing as well as a recirculating pump for cooling the water jacket of your condenser. Under my lab bench is where I keep most of my everyday lab supplies. The top left cubby has pipettes, lighters, thermometers, stirring rods. The middle cubby has my density meters, uh, toothpicks, microscope slides for making TLC plates, as well as uh, sample bags. The top right cubby is where I house my test tubes as well as gas syringes. The bottom shelf has my heat sources including an alcohol stove, a gas stove, as well as alcohol burners, my mortar and pestles, uh, filter paper, funnels, volumetric flasks, 
uh, as well as graduated cylinders. There are many different types of thermometers for different purposes. However, the four shown here are what I consider essential for the home lab. The first one is the alcohol and glass thermometer, which is the most common and can be used for a wide variety of purposes, including distillation. It is not the most accurate, which is why I suggest you also get a mercury and glass thermometer. These are getting harder to find, but searching on eBay should allow you to buy one for relatively cheap, and one can be used to calibrate all your other alcohol thermometers. Moving on is a cheap uh, probe type electronic uh, thermometer. These can be used for quickly checking the temperature of a solution or other reaction mixture. And finally is the thermocouple, or in this case, a K-type thermocouple probe along with meter. Now these are super duper handy for making measurements of really high temperatures or really low temperatures that are outside the range of your other thermometers. An accurate and precise electronic balance is essential for amateur chemistry, especially if you want to get into analytical chemistry. You don't have to spend a lot of money on an analytical balance such as this one, which is accurate down to the milligram. Instead, you can opt for a cheap pocket scale such as this one, which is still accurate down to 0.01 grams. However, I do not suggest getting a balance which has a lower resolution than this. The next thing for you to consider is what to use as a heating source in your lab. Although flames used to be popular, they are now almost completely replaced by electronic heating methods. I personally recommend you purchase a hot plate stirrer, which allows you to both heat and magnetically stir your reaction mixture at the same time. These are not cheap, however, you may occasionally find good deals on sites such as eBay. Make sure you buy from reputable companies such as Thermo Scientific or Corning, and whatever you do, stay the heck away from Chinese knockoff brands since those struggle to boil even a liter of water and will break down after two or three months. I had to go through three of those before I learned my lesson. Additionally, if you plan on doing a lot of organic reactions, then it is essential for you to also get a heating mantle. This is a 500 milliliter capacity one, and I feel like that is the best compromise between size as well as efficiency. Now, these are very useful because they heat round bottom flasks much faster than a hot plate as the contact area is much larger. Finally, for high temperature reactions, I recommend you get a cheap uh, nichrome wire ceramic heater such as this one. They are used for high temperature applications such as distilling sulfuric acid. This is my fume hood where I perform some of the more dangerous experiments that can produce irritating gases or cause splattering. Uh, apologies, the light inside is not working, which is why it's so dark. I am fortunate to live in an area where these are relatively cheap. However, if that is not the case for you, then a squirrel cage fan or a ventilation fan connected to some ducting leading out the window is usually adequate enough. Otherwise, perform the experiment outdoors. The cabinet under the fume hood is where I keep most of my beakers, flasks, and reagent bottles. The most versatile size of beaker to get if you're just getting started is a 250 milliliter one. However, make sure you get a few larger ones such as the one liter and two liter sizes. Additionally, flasks are rarely used and so if you're on a tight budget, then skip those entirely. There's not much to see here, so I'll go over it briefly. The top shelf is where I keep my vacuum pump, my water recirculator, as well as heating mantle. The second shelf is where I keep my electrolysis apparatus as well as uh, secondary hot plates. The third shelf is where I keep my used reagent bottles for reuse as well as new cans for solvents. And finally, the bottom uh, shelf is for a small fire extinguisher as well as my waste containers. Most inorganic compounds and salts, as well as acids and bases, can be disposed of down the drain with plenty of water. Unless they contain a heavy metal, such as cobalt, iron, copper, nickel, etc., in which case they should be kept and brought to a hazardous waste disposal. Additionally, organic solvents should not be disposed of down the drain. Instead, they should be separated into two containers, one containing particulates while the other one does not. This allows for easier distillation and separation if so desired. Broken glass should be placed in a sharps container and not disposed of with the rest of the trash where it may cut through the bag or otherwise injure people. A little bit more about fire safety in the lab. It is crucial you always have at least one fire extinguisher on hand. 
This is because virtually all liquids you encounter, besides aqueous ones, will be flammable. Now, I prefer to have two types of fire extinguishers, both the dry chemical as well as carbon dioxide versions. I personally prefer the carbon dioxide version because it does not leave a residue when used. It is also very handy to have a small car-sized one right under the lab bench for easy access. Please note that dry chemical as well as carbon dioxide fire extinguishers are not suitable for Class K, also known as metal fires. For those, you should have a bucket of kitty litter or dry sand available. This is my personal protective equipment station and is also where I keep my lab safety supplies. At a minimum, you need disposable nitrile gloves, as well as a good pair of safety goggles. Now, normal safety glasses are not sufficient because liquids can go through the gap and get into your eyes. Make sure you get ones that go all the way around your face and are tight fitting so that does not happen. Additionally, I personally really like using face shields because they're convenient to wear and also because they protect the rest of your face. If you want to do experiments that produce toxic or otherwise dangerous gases, then a respirator with cartridges is highly recommended. The side of the room opposite my lab bench is my workshop area. This is where I keep all of my DIY supplies. In addition to just enjoying DIY in general, being an amateur chemist requires a lot of creative ingenuity at times. Having such a workspace allows you to build your own chemistry apparatus as well as complex setups. Finally, a few non-essential lab items that are handy to have. The first is parafilm. This stuff is amazing. You can use it to cover up basically any container and prevent bugs, dirt, and other debris from falling onto your thrice recrystallized product while you take a well-deserved nap. Secondly, wash bottles are very useful because you can add small amounts of solvent or distilled water into a reaction. They also serve the purpose of being able to help you wash as well as rinse out glassware. Third, a propane or map gas torch can help you unfreeze stuck ground glass joints as well as the heat up reaction mixtures quickly. However, be careful when doing this so that thermal shock does not crack your container.